advocacy published in, in Huffington Post, Washington Post, and New York Times. Dr. Nadia Brown is the editor of the Politics Groups and Identities Journal. She's a board member of Women Also Know Stuff, and I encourage all our audience members to look that up. It's a very important tool within political science to showcase that women are also knowledge makers and not only knowledge seekers. And she is also part of the Me Too Political Science Collective, which does many things, including making sure that issues of sexual harassment are addressed within political science as a discipline. And so Dr. Brown, I am so excited once again, we're going to be hearing from you from your excellent book. And it couldn't have come at a better time now, I think, than uh, with the discussions going on about appointing the first black woman to the Supreme Court. I know that your book is on politics, women in the legislature, but some of the themes I think will cut across what we're seeing now with um, the confirmation hearing. And so to end up on this note, I would also like to mention that at the Center for Women, Gender and Global Leadership at Howard, we are all about students. That's why the vision for the center was created. And so we have students here in my class who will probably show up on the screen later to ask some of the questions. But I'm very excited to say that the discussion for this presentation is a Howard University master's student in the political science department, Ms. Shaletta Norwood, who has read the book and will be engaging Dr. Brown in a conversation. So what better way than to have a Howard alum engage with a Howard current student and also having Howard students present and listening. So I'm very excited. I'll hand over the discussion now to Dr. Brown. Thank you very much for honoring our invitation and we're looking forward to your excellent presentation. Over to you, Dr. Brown. Thank you so much, Dr. Dewani. This is such, um, such an honor. I can't even tell you how, um, how full my heart is right now to be able to share with my beloved uh, Howard University. Um, so I am going to talk with you today, um, give you an overview of a book that I co-authored with a junior scholar, Danielle uh, Casares Lemmy. And I'll talk to you um, about the, the kind of like the overview, the theoretical contributions and how this book came about. And then I'll open it over to um, for discussions. But I also just want to put a pin in this that um, because I co-authored this book and I gave space for the for a junior scholar to write the two um, last chapters of the book, I'm really open to um, questions around um, mentoring, co-authorship, how to navigate this profession as a junior scholar, and uh, and how to work with senior scholars as uh, a ready partner. This is my contact information. So for those of you that are in the audience, please reach out um, at my email address because the Georgetown website is hard to navigate. It's nadia.brown at georgetown.edu. And I can be found on Twitter at Brown PhD Girl. So this book tackles um, Black women's hair as a political uh, artifact or, or a political consequence. And when I first started this work many, many years ago, I was asked this question, why Black women's hair? Indeed, I was at a present, I was giving a presentation on earlier iterations of this project at the Midwest Political Science Association, which is a, um, a pretty white male dominated conference. And I gave this talk and the discussant said to me, like, with, in all earnesty, looked me dead in my eye and said, what's the difference between um, getting black women's hair and just having a bad haircut? Like if I got an $8 supercut, um, haircut from supercuts, this would be the same thing as what you're trying to discuss. And I was floored and devastated. And, it, um, and I cried and it took me, uh, you know, a couple of weeks to, to regroup, but I was more resolved than ever to come back stronger. And so what that meant to me was I was presenting this research in a way that was not accessible to people who needed to hear it the most, and that were white men, right? So um, that they should be able to understand how and why Black women's hair have political significance. And in order to do so, it made me become a stronger and more resolute scholar. So I did much more work by bringing in interdisciplinary scholars um, because in political science, Black women's hair has not been talked about, right? So this is the first book to do so. And uh, so it meant that I needed to reach out of the discipline of political science and go to places like 
women's studies, Africana studies, um, uh, sociology, anthropology, and history that were doing this work, but just not with a political focus. So I'll spend some little bit of time talking to you about why Black women's hair, but again, giving this to a Howard University audience, you all get it and understand in intimate ways because of our culture and our communities. But to explain this right, to people on the outside took a lot of skill. Um, and to be honest, right, a lot, a lot of work on, on my behalf. So um, sociologists have found that Black women's hair has political meaning, and that hair still has political meaning. So if you were to ask an average person to close their eyes and in their mind's eye, if I were to say the word Afro, what immediately comes to mind? And for most, it would be Angela Davis and this, you know, her huge freedom liberation Afro. Or when people are asked to close their eyes and think about an Afro, they might think about Colin Kaepernick um, and how his hair um, stood out as a symbol of Black nationalism when he decided to kneel for the national anthem and how he's been blacklisted from the NFL. Um, and so those, even though many people have Afros, right, many people wear their hair in a natural state, whether they're considering it a large Afro like Colin Kaepernick or, um, or Angela Davis, that hairstyle still symbolizes for many people a Black nationalist um, uh, determination. So um, although many people walk around with Afros that don't necessarily have these political stances, this is what most um, you know, Americans still think if the term Afro is brought up. And so to do so, right, I had to really lean in, okay, so what about Black women's hair? So we know that they have political meanings, but what does this matter for Black women? So scholars in women's studies and history have long shown that hair has social implications for how Black women are treated, that Black women with, who are able to have, um, grow their hair longer to be to straighten it and keep it straight, Black women with looser curls have upward social mobility. They're able to have higher educational attainment rates. They're able to marry up, which means marrying um, partners who are e economically mobile. And then themselves, these women um, by proxy can become upwardly mobile. Um, and so women that have a certain, Black women have a certain aesthetic that their hair is more manageable, um, that is able to be malleable, leads them to a different social class or social status. Again, from historians, we know that there are historical factors that continue to mediate Black women's bodies and their hair. And so um, an example of these historical factors are that during enslavement, Black women were punished by having their heads shaved or having their head, their scalps branded or scarred so that their hair would grow in patches or unevenly or not at all in certain spaces. And that was a way to, to disrupt Black women's perceived allure or beauty, right? To take away their crown and glory as a form of punishment um, was... Um, was something that was done to enslaved women. But that's still connection to right, how Black women's hair grows out of their heads in a way to den denigrate their bodies, to denigrate the curl patterns and to say that they should look more like uh, European or Euro-American um, hair, this is something that has stayed with, um, with Black women. Indeed, it was uh, Thomas and Jefferson in, in the notes um, on Virginia that wrote, how can Black women be attractive? Their hair grows in the same way that men do, and it's not attractive. There's nothing feminine about Black women's hair. So this has been a discussion, an historical concession that has been had that continues until this day. But the great thing about Black women is that we redefine our hair. As Nola Way Rook says, they flip it and reverse it. So things that were meant for Black women's degradation or for their downfall, Black women took and made it for their glory. So there are examples of Black women um, that, particularly in Louisiana and Alabama, in places that had large presence of Catholicism during um, during um, Jim Crow reconstruction and enslavement were asked to cover their heads, right? Because they were seen as less pious, but then also um, were seen as attracting people, uh, particularly, particularly men, white men to them because of their elaborate hairstyles. So black women um, after enslavement were uh, doing their hair in elaborate ways that showed off their kinks, their corals and their curls that some saw as a way to um, 
to really entice white men to think of them as romantic partners. So there were rules put in place that black women had to wear head scarves and to cover their heads um, and their hair. And what black women did with that was took really beautiful color um, pieces of cloth and tied their hair up and, and, did, and did so in a way that was just as attractive or even more attractive than what their hairstyles were. And so black women have taken what was for their downfall like these laws that made them cover their heads in public and then made themselves into stunning eye-catching you know, eye, eye head turners. Um, but they also, when they had problems with their hair, again, because of lack of nutrition, um, lack of sanitary conditions, they were still able to find ways to beautify themselves and to adorn themselves, right? And that hair becomes a part of that process. So Black women have always, I mean, historians have shown us this, right? Have always found ways to beautify themselves and as and hair has been a central site of that. So moving from that kind of interdisciplinary literature, I'll talk a little bit about uh, how I bring this into political science is that we know that voters evaluate Black women candidates based on their hairstyle and texture. So previous work from Danielle and myself show that when Black women candidates have natural, um, natural hairstyles and are darker skin, voters perceive them to be more nationalistic and more likely to uh, vote for things that are better or better uh, policy preferences for Black constituents or Black policies. Um, and that those with straighter hair and lighter skin are more likely to be assimilationist and try to work with whites. So even though the candidate themselves hasn't laid out a position as such, voters see this candidate and prescribe that onto them. Um, my first, um, the first article that I wrote that kind of jumped onto this project in 2014 was, um, kind of happened serendipitously. Uh, I was talking with legislators, this grew out of my dissertation research that later turned into the book sisters in the state house. But one part that I couldn't shake was that legislators were talking to me about how their phenotype, particularly how their skin tone and hair texture influenced how constituents saw them and influenced the legislative decision-making process, influenced the legislative experiences in the Maryland state house. And it was tied to misconceptions or preconceived notions about who they would be based on their hair texture and skin tone. So I'll end with this, right, about Black women's hair. I want us to remember that hair is both the site of agency and predeterminedness. And what this simply means is that your hair grows out of your head in ways that you can't control, right? This is the DNA that was passed on to you from your ancestors. So the coil of your hair, the shape, the texture, all of these things are your genetics. Those are things, that, again, that are predetermined. You can't change them. Um, you can't change your genetic makeup. But because of, um, because of human agency and as a social science, hair is a site that lets us see culture because it's worked on by human hair, by human hands. So you have done something today to show up in this class or on the Zoom space in ways that you feel most comfortable in showing up. You cut it, you dyed it, you curled it, you locked it, um, you braided it, you added extensions, or you put a wig on, right? All of these things are what you could control in how you want it to make yourself look, right? So you have agency as an actor into how you decided to go out in public. And it's also worth mentioning, right, that this is culturally and time specific. So what you have on today, the hairstyle that you have selected, will most likely look different. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, and look different than what it did 10 years from now, 15 years, you know, 15 years ago. And so hair is both the site of structure and agency because it's worked on, manipulated by human hands to fit and, and fit a specific time, culture, and space. Although the coils and kinks that you have um, are predetermined and are things that your ancestors were probably working with as well, you just make it look different in this particular time. Um, or perhaps, you know, not, right? You could be wearing a throwback hairstyle or something. So I want to end with, right, is aesthetics matter, but they can be controlled and managed. So in this book, I do this deep dive into a beautiful intersectional mess. And this is a title from a 2006 article that Wendy Smooth wrote, one of the um, premier Black women in politics scholars, one of the foundational scholars. And what she urged political science to do was 
don't be afraid of intersectionality. For those that are empirical scholars who want to put people into these binary boxes, black or white, male or female, what they're missing are that nuance of what is it, what is the experience of black women? You can't get that out of these binary controls and don't be afraid of it. What you're going to learn is something much, much better, much more nuanced, much more dynamic and closer to a reality that helps us to understand social, uh, our social world around us. So I took this, I took this article and I still think about this because what I want to do is extend that beautiful intersectional mess, right? That, that deep intersectional mess. And to do so, I think hair is a perfect place to look at that. So um, this picture that you see here on my left is a picture of Councilwoman Edwards in Boston City Council in 2019, who wanted to um, in introduce the Crown Act. And the Crown Act is a, um, a piece of legislation that is making its way through the federal government and state and local governments that are making it illegal to discriminate on people based on the texture of their hair. And then if they need to wear protective hairstyles that they should be allowed to do so. And what Councilwoman Edwards did in this Boston City Council is she said that um, she was wanting to pass this bill for little girls and boys that looked like her in the school system, right? And so you might be aware that they have been several high profile cases where children with protective hairstyles were asked to take down those hairstyles or be forced to um, forgo graduation, to forgo prom, to be, um, to be suspended from school until they changed their hairstyle until it met until it met codes. And what Councilwoman Edwards wanted to do was say that like, that is erasing their culture. And I'm doing this not for me today. What she said that she was doing this for little black girls and boys who need this bill now. And I put this up here, right? Because this is a different orientation than we think about in political science literature, that, that this black woman councilwoman wasn't making a bill for voters, right? These children can't vote. She wasn't making a bill to impact her life. Uh, so it wasn't a self-seeking uh, election, which is what we know about in political science literature. But she was doing this out of a principled stance as a black woman with Afro textured hair. And again, it's a much different orientation to politics than what we talk about or what we learn in political science. This middle picture here is a tweet from Zerlina Maxwell who showed a picture of Kamala Harris when she was still in the primary, the Democratic presidential primary uh, back in early 2020. And she's going to ask for a woman's vote, another black woman's vote in the beauty shop. And I love this for a couple of reasons. First, um, Kamala Harris is going and asking for this woman's vote where she is. So she's removing this transactional politics, right? That she's not saying, voters, come see me where I am, you know, get this $100 ticket or come stand outside at this rally that I'm holding. She's going to where the black women are and asking them questions and asking them, talking with them and asking for their vote. Other thing is this black woman is completely in the element, right? You see her with a, um, a, a shower cap on, a plastic cap on, uh, deep conditioning her hair under a hooded dryer, right? So she is in some ways a captive audience. She has at least 15, 20 minutes underneath this hair dryer. She ain't going nowhere. But also, right, you see her looking in to Kamala Harris, right? So she's engaged, perhaps somebody who would not have gone to a Kamala Harris rally. But Kamala Harris is recognizing that beauty shops are a sacred space for Black women. So we know from work from Melissa Harris Perry that beauty shops and barber shops are places where Black people have constantly talked about their, their policies, their political preferences, and use this as an indigenous site to discuss politics outside of the watchful eye of white folks. Other thing that I love about this is that for me, this is a nod to Madam C.J. Walker, the first black woman millionaire who made her living, who made her millions by training black women how on hair care and hair care maintenance, right? We think about her as straightening hair with a hot comb, but actually what she was initially doing was providing um, regimens and treatments for black women to care for their hair in, in an area and space where there really was a burgeoning um, beauty industry that was really based in kind of like quackery and not additional science. So what Madam C.J. Walker was showing were proven hair care tactics and techniques for people that just didn't have um, access to knowing what kind of things, products should they put on their hair and what is, what's healthy and what is not. What Madam C.J. Walker did was she had these Walker agents, these other black women who would then work for her and sell, be their own independent Walker agents, their own independent, you know, um, 
beauty entrepreneurs and walk door to door and sell their hair products, right? And talk with black women in the comfort of their own homes about how to do their hair, what products to put on their hair. And in doing so, Madam CJ Walker created a new class of black women, right? We made black women entrepreneurs that took them outside of the domestic sphere in white homes, whether as cooks or laundresses or other domestics that cleaned houses or watched children. She gave black women an opportunity to have economic standing on their own. And in doing so, she also got them outside of the watchful eye of black men, right? Who, um, because of patriarchy, earned more money and then were able to um, kind of control what black women did or could not do. Black women were then independent entrepreneurs because of this. So seeing all of this in this picture and in this space, right, shows that Kamala Harris in some ways, right, gets what it is like for Black women on multiple levels. And then this last picture here is of Ayanna Presley when she went on the AM Joy Show, which um, again was several years back. And she was very, very um, open about having alopecia when she came out and said that she lost her last strand of hair right before President Trump's first impeachment. And that the stress from that kind of exacerbated the alopecia. But for um, Ayanna Presley, she had built a political brand on having natural hair. So she was known by her signature Senegalese twist, and she gave several interviews about why she wanted to remain natural as the first Black woman to represent Massachusetts as a way for Black women and girls and boys to look up and say that you can represent this state, the state that is overwhelmingly white, that has deep-seated racism and continued racism, right, to send a Black woman that looks like her to Congress. And then when her hair fell out, right, she felt that it was a, a duty of hers to share that I have to be transparent. Alopecia impacts so many Black women. And as we saw, right, a couple of weeks ago with Jada Pinkett Smith, right, the alopecia has, is no respecter of, of, you know, of name, of class, of title, that it happens to Black women. So what Ayanna Presley is intimately saying is that hair is political, right? And for Black women, hair is political. And so this, this last slide um, is my intervention into political science. I take this quote from Audre Lorde and she says, if I didn't define myself for myself, I would be crunched into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive. And what I argue is that political science has eaten black women alive. They've always assessed, measured, compared black women to other groups as a deviant group, right? Why don't they act and vote like black, black men? Why don't they act or vote like white men or white women? Without fully understanding what makes black women tick. And then so, right, they're crunching black women into their fantasies of what other groups should be and not really understanding who they are and what they're doing and why they're doing it. And so what I want to do in this book and actually in my whole life's work as a political scientist is make sure that Black women can show up as their full and authentic selves and that they can define themselves for themselves and what that means politically so that they are not eaten alive. And I'll stop there and turn this over to a question and answer. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, thank you so much. That was so amazing. So much information. And I'm just so honored to be here with you. Thank you, Dr. Dewani, um, for having Dr. Brown here with us today. Um, so my first question, um, I said, Dr. Brown, at the beginning of your book, you note that Kamala Harris competence as an attorney general, a senator, and now the first woman of color vice president has been assessed in part of the basis of her record but also in the context of racialized gender beauty aesthetics. How often do you believe Black women are categorized and discriminated against on the basis of aesthetic beauty? So what I, um, I realized that I did not do is um, share the first slide of the talk. So I'll see if I can share this here. Um, and so what really started, what really made me, let me know I have a I have something here. Are these two pictures? Um, so to to get to Shalita's question, um, I started doing this work, and I was told that there was no difference among Black women, right? That there was no there there to study because Black women voted the same. They're mostly Democrats. They had the same policy preferences, and they tended to have the same um, outlook in politics. We know that's not true, um, but right, that 
um, that was the argument. And so one way that I tried to, to come at this, and, and I do this in different, in different places, but in this book, I try to come at this by aesthetics, right? So Kamala Harris in a private fundraiser when she was still a state's attorney general in California was called by Barack Obama, who she was introducing at this private fundraiser, the most attractive state's attorneys general. And, you know, he thanked her for the, you know, for, for the talk and went on and, you know, did his fundraising spiel. Well, later on to the media, um, this comment gets leaked and feminists are all up in arms and they're saying Kamala Harris is a intelligent woman, the first state's attorney's general, black woman state's attorney's general. She has a law degree, a degree from Howard University. She has done all of the things to be exceptionally well. She's, she is bright, she is smart. Why would you talk about what she looks like as opposed to her qualifications? So juxtapose that to in 2018, Stacey Abrams went on The Breakfast Club, which is an urban syndicated radio show, we sat in New York City, and was told, and she told the co-host that people don't think that he's a viable candidate because she's dark skin, heavy set, natural hair, and has no husband. And the co-host laughed that off and said, but you're the most qualified person in the race. And they went on to list all of her qualifications, right? That she is has a law degree. She has a master's in public administration. She's a graduate from Spelman University. She was one of the most powerful and effective minority leaders in the Georgia State House. All of these things are true, right? But in both cases, right, the elephant in the room was never addressed. So for Stacey Abrams, right, no one in the room wanted to respond to the negative stereotypes of her being heavy set, natural hair, overweight not having a husband. And the other side, right, no one wanted to address Kamala Harris's um, qualifications, right, that the, instead, right, the emphasis was on what she looked like. And I share that, I share these two examples because it's really important to see these Black women who some will say they're both Democrats, they're both leaders within the Democratic Party. They have done both of them have done a lot in the last, uh, in recent years to up the profile of black women in politics on the national level and have shifted the conversation from our black women qualified and capable to these individual women and like, what are their talents and qualifications? All of that is true, right? I'm not, I'm not denying any of this and saying that we shouldn't ask those questions. But instead what I'm saying is, but by looking at them, right? And the kind of reception that they have based on what they look like, there have been different assessments of them that we don't talk about, but that are readily here, right? So Kamala Harris, the descendant of a South Indian mother and a Jamaican father who immigrated to the United States for college. Stacey Abrams, right, the daughter of Mississippi sharecroppers who then relocate to, to Atlanta, um, right? It, this is, you know, a daughter of the South. These are different women with different lived experiences who look distinctly different, right? Abrams, darker skin, kinky, coily hair. Kamala Harris, lighter skin, longer, more flowy hair, right? And what they look like hasn't been lost on people and let alone themselves. So to answer more directly, right, Shalita's question, this, this distinctly matters in how the public assesses these women, but also these women know these things, right? Like Stacey Abrams said, I'm gonna say this first, right? I'm not gonna let, you know, my, my detractors go on, you know, and talk about this. I'm gonna state this, but the uncomfortability, right? That we face in saying the obvious, right? And kind of the legacies of white supremacy and why these things continue to matter in American politics are what I really wanna call out. Yes, thank you, thank you for that answer. Um, so for the second question, I asked, how often do you feel colorism and hair discrimination negatively impact Black women's political opportunities relative to Black women with darker skin complexion and coarse texture hair? In the book, we do an experiment, well, a, a real a real-time experiment because we have all of the headshots of women that ran in 2020. And so we were able to, sorry, 2018. And so we were able to show, right, who won and who lost and the regional variation based on their skin tone and hair texture and hairstyle. And so there are real um, preferences for voters. And we know that because we've seen that in real time. But also the candidates talk about that, right? The candidates have said that People, um, people don't expect them to look a certain way um, if they want to be elected. So if a black woman wants to be elected in certain districts, they know maybe the motor operandi is straightening your hair 
or maybe the mode of operandi in that district is having loose curls, right? But not a kinky tight, tight afro. Um, so, so these women have agency themselves, right? So they know that these things matter and they adjust and work towards it. It doesn't mean that they accept it, right? I wanna be really, really clear. It doesn't mean that they're just like, oh, it's just these things are happening to me, so I'm doing them. They recognize this, right? And they say that I've made this choice to do X. So whether it is to blow dry my hair so that it appears straight when I am on TV, and then you know, rock my natural curls and twist outs or whatever on other days, I do that. Others have said, I decided that I want to chemically relax my hair because that is the look that I know will get me elected. And also I feel more comfortable with that. But these are things that candidates themselves um, are keenly aware of. Thank you. So in chapter five, you and your fellow colleagues partner with the Black Women's Political Action Committee of Texas to conduct research on Black women elites. Um, you all used a focus group method for your study and found at the beginning of your study that when these Black women politicians called out descriptors that they believe represent Black women, they used words like confident, prepared, knowledgeable, um, experienced, thick-skinned, focused, and um, ethical, to name a few. You then note that because the world does not usually view Black women in this positive light, Black women themselves have a difficult time seeing themselves outside of the controlling images that society has imposed upon them. However, relative to their responses, could we argue that Black women no longer identify with the images society has attempted to impose upon them? So, um, no, <laughs> I guess the short answer. Um, all right, so so Black women are, are deeply cognizant of how society views them, and that isn't going anywhere. But what they're also saying is that Black women have these positive attributes, right? And that's why we are voting for them. That's why we are leaders. That's why others should vote for them. And I know this because of my deep and intimate connection to Black women, right? So it's not just me, myself, but I'm thinking about others that I'm working in community with. And so what they're in, instead of inviting us to do is to change the narrative, right? So they, they recognize all too well that there are these still negative stereotypes about them. But what they want to do, and I think what, what the world we are seeing now to this particular moment, as Professor Dewani uh, mentioned with um, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, soon to be Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, that we are helping like, shape the narrative. Right? Black women are helping to shift the narrative that Black women are competent, that they're qualified. And so we know that, that those negative stereotypes are out there. Like again, with Katanji Brown Jackson, for an example, um, right? Ted Cruz said that she was the most, would be the most radical uh, judge on the Supreme Court. Tom Cotton uh, said yesterday that while one Justice Jackson went to prosecute Nazis, he thinks that this one will try to defend them, right? There's this imagination that Black women are soft on crime or that Black women are incompetent or Black women basically don't know their head from a hole in the ground. And so we know that that narrative is out there. We saw it played out yesterday, right? It's, and I'm sure that there's something that's going to be said today. But what Black women in the study are saying is, but we are actively working to change that, right? Because we know this is true. And so the same thing with like the social media campaigns that Black women organizations have been putting on for the time Brown Jackson that is saying hashtag qualified, hashtag women with Black women, right? All of these things that we know are Black women who are using their voices and power to combat that same racist and stereotypical views of Black women to say that we don't have to take this laying down, right? That we have agency in ourselves and we're going to try to change that narrative. Yes, and for a follow-up question, um, and it kind of just plays into everything that you just stated, could we argue that Black women know that they are great and it's just taking the rest of the world an extensive amount of time to appreciate their worth and their value? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so this is, um, right, black, black women, I think are living in a different political, um, are living in a different political moment. And the world has shifted in a lot of ways. Um, and so that Black women can stand in their own power without having to ask, right? So the fact that um, you know, we have Kamala Harris, and it's not, let me be clear, like Kamala Harris is the byproduct of Black women advocacy, right? 
he is brought on because other Black women have laid the groundwork for her and have fought for her. And there could have been other vice presidents, right, that um, before her, right? Black women have always been qualified to do this position. But Black women are now stepping up and have access to power in ways they haven't before. And so that's what's changed, right? Not that Black women were never qualified, right? Not that Black women didn't have um, the skills or, or, or skill set to do this. It's just that they didn't have access to power like they do now. Yes. So Dr. Brown, you received your bachelor's in political science here at Howard in 2004. What was your experience like here at Howard and how do you feel things have changed for Black women in politics from then to now? Oh, so I am so, so pleased to see the Center for Women and Gender Global Leadership, and I am pleased that Professor Dewani is at the helm. Um, and so things have changed a lot. So this center wasn't there <laughs> when, when I was there. There was no women's studies at Howard when I was there. And I distinctly remember, um, and, and I share this story not as a mark on, um, on Howard, but just as some, um, as a way for me to to how I grew. Um, so, um, so then there was a professor when I was there uh, who did not, who was a, who didn't, he didn't have a gendered analysis at all. And he said in class, I remember being like 19 years old, um, super like not, didn't have my voice, wasn't confident. You know, I'm, I'm just so thankful to, to be here. But he said, um, he said that rape was an attack, rape on a black woman was an attack on black masculinity because black men could not defend their women. And I sat there in class and I said, that doesn't sound right, right? But I didn't know what else to say, right? I didn't have, I didn't have the voice, I didn't have the tool, I didn't have the agency, I just felt, I knew I was like, I knew I, in hindsight, right, I was this burgeoning political, I was this burgeoning feminist, but I didn't have the words to know that then. But I know now, right, with professors, right, like Professor Dewani, Professor Grant, Professors um, Keisha Middlemass and Niambi Carter, right, um, even Professor Robert, Robbie Perry that are in the program now, statements like that wouldn't happen, right? There would not be a professor that could say that um, and get away with this. Um, and so when I was at Howard, Professor Julia Jordan Zachary came at my senior year, was the first and only Black feminist on, um, on staff when I was there. Um, Professor May King was retiring. We had Professor Jane Flax, who um, was a political, white woman political theorist, who helped kind of give me the language and the tools towards the end of my, my career at Howard. But when I first started, I distinctly remember that. And thinking, you know, thinking back to my 19-year-old self, I wish I had the confidence to say no. That's not right. Right, rape is sexual assault, and that's violence on the black woman's body. Who it's happening on, and we should think about that. While we can also perhaps think about masculinity, right, but that is not the the initial attack on violence. So things have changed so much, and I'm so glad that it has. And lastly, Dr. Brown, what advice would you give to future researchers who seek to enter into the particular field of study? Um, what steps would you advise them to take to capture a thorough depiction and understanding of Black women's politicians' experiences? So I think it's a both, both things are needed. So um, for, for Howard students who are here in the nation's capital, you have an excellent opportunity to be, to be with Black women's organizations, to be a part of Black women's organizations, to volunteer, to do internships with organizations, but also on Congress, right? Here and also in DC, right? To see a Black woman mayor, right? There are so many things that depending on, so I just left a job in Indiana. There was no Black women, right? So that coming back to the East Coast, it's just like, ah, oh, right? I'm so, I'm so glad to be here because things that I took for granted as being, you know, I'm from Jersey, went to Howard, right? Things I took for granted about Black women's political leadership just don't look the same in other parts of the country. So I would urge students that are there now to get experiential um, opportunities. So it's not enough just to read about things in a book, but if you have hands-on opportunities, take advantage of them. Do things like work with the center, work with uh, Professor Elsie Scott, who, um, who chairs the uh, Ron Walter Center, right? Like there, there's just so many opportunities at Howard that I want students to take advantage of um, because our location in DC puts you in different proximity to power and the opportunity to, um, to influence power in ways that wouldn't happen if you decided to go to 
you know, Hampton University or like some other place, right? So take, take advantage of that. And then the other thing is, and I know Howard students do so well, is read, ask questions, right? Study. Um, you all are here because you are excellent. And so you have the tools to do it. So marry your book knowledge with the experiential knowledge and you'll go far. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. Thank you. I th I'm, I'm gonna hand it over to the audience to ask questions. I see, thank you very much for that wonderful discussion. So as I told you, we have an audience in the Zoom room, but we also have excellent students at Howard University taking my intro to women, gender, and sexualities, which is part of the required courses for the minor in women, gender, and sexualities, which we introduced just this year. And so I have a string of students and I tell you, they have hard questions, but I know that you are a great professor. So I will let them come in and ask, and then we will take it from there. So over here, introduce yourself. Hello. <clears throat> um, hi, Dr. Brown. My name is Logan Ford. I'm a freshman political science major, women's studies minor. Um, first, I loved hearing you speak. And my question is on Kamala Harris. So one of the biggest things that I recognize when she um, was in the running for president was the difference between her now and the, the difference between her when she was at Howard. So mm. now her hair is straight and she's a fairly moderate um, politician, but back when she was at Howard, she had some fro action going on <laughs> and you've been a political science um, student at Howard. You know that a lot of our teachings and curriculum are fairly black nationalist. And so my question is, it relates to what you said before about uh, Black women defining themselves for themselves based on their hair. How do you think that uh, Kamala Harris is defining herself, given the fact that she's changed her hair and her views? And uh, do you think that it's intentional for the audience that she's appealing to? Or do you mm. think that it's a real change in her political views? So I don't know her, so I can't personally say what I think is happening. I can share what I think what I've read, like most other, you know, lay people who I'm, I'm as a political scientist, I have skill sets that are different than lay people, right? But again, like she ain't my girl. I don't know her, right? So it's really difficult to make um kind of like concrete judgments about her political calculations. Um, when you could only really go on what you what she said um and not, you know, have that intimate view of seeing the evolution of her, how her thoughts have changed. But I do think that she is pragmatic. I think that she has made a decision on how to represent herself based on her political aspirations that, um, that have evolved over time. So I say that to say that I think that she is doing what she thinks is right for her in order to get where she wants to go. I don't necessarily think that this means that she is trying to whitewash or assimilate. I think that she does um, everything that I've read and people that, um, that I know who've had, who have worked with her in the White House or, or working with her in the White House now, have said that she does change the conversation in the room to center black women or to center people that are marginalized, right? And so perhaps if she needed to, or think that she needed to present herself in a way in order to be in the room to ask those kind of questions, that might be a trade-off that she is willing to make. But I do know that she has opportunities that are available to her, even if it is just, you know, flat ironing her hair or blow drying her hair that allows her to be more presentable. So the words that she says that comes out of her mouth, um, that could have come out of Stacey Abrams' mouth, uh, or any other, you know, dark skin, heavy set, black woman with natural hair might be perceived differently because of how she chooses to present herself. And that might be a political calculation that she takes. I don't know. But, but again, I don't know her. But I do think that at all of what I've read from her, and, you know, in her biography, of what I've read in the press, of uh, my conversation with people who work intimately with her in the White House say that she is pragmatic, right? So it's much more, I think, than modernism, but she's thinking like, how do I reach my goal and what do I need to kind of give up on or what do I need to push harder on to get what I want? And that's that seems to be her, her stance more than anything else. Thank you for your question. Hello, Dr. Brown. I'm so um, good to be able to hear from you today. I actually saw you speak at, uh, well, virtually at ENCOBS a couple weeks ago so and both times you just spoke so well and so um, my question I'm so glad to come after that question because my question is um, 
um, how do Black women decide when to rebel and when to pragmatically conform to get in the door? Like what goes into that decision? Does that change whether of your local or, or national? Is that like, is the, and I know this is a personal question for each politician, but like, what is the best way forward? Do you start off straightening your hair? And then once you get in office, like, yeah. um, like trick them, like what, what is the best way to change the perception of Black women as politicians and in leadership? Yeah, so in um, in my focus groups and personal interviews or the one-on-one -on -one interviews with Black women, I've seen that go both ways, right? So one woman who um, who ran in one seat in the Missouri State House um, on the lower chamber ran as a, I mean, it is, um, ran as a Black nationalist, is a Black nationalist, right? I don't, her views have not changed. Um, but when she was in the house, she wore a hijab. He's a member of the Nation of Islam. People knew her by her signature, like kind of colorful hijabs that she would wear. When she decided to run for the Senate, she stopped wearing the hijab. And people said, are you trying to be more mainstream? Are you trying to like, you know, get the white people's votes now? You're not going to be as, um, um, as concerned with, with, with members of our community, black members of our community. And what she said to me was that the hijab was, um, rubbing against the nape, um, you know, her temples on the nape of her neck and were causing her hair to break off. And so she decided to stop wearing the hijab for that reason. So that's what she said to me. But right, people, um, her constituents thought that something was up, right? That she wanted to run for this higher office. So she decided to present herself differently. But conversely, I spoke with a woman who um, is a longtime member of a Texas city council and shared that she wore her hair straight for many, many years. She went through menopause and started to sweat from her head. I and mean, when she was having hot flashes, it was just like, I got to get rid of all this hair, cut off her relaxed hair and wore a little Afro. And then since then I started braiding it up. And she said, you know, it was just more convenient to wear her hair in box braids. Um, or twist or something like that because she didn't have to worry about doing it. She can work out and not worry about her hair. And she says, it doesn't concern her one bit because she's been in the seat for so long that people know her, people you know, recognize her policy preferences. They know that she's gonna fight for their community. So for her, hair wasn't an issue. And she um, is an older woman. Um, I believe at the time of the interview, she was in her late sixties. So she had a real hard time understanding how younger women were saying this, right? Because she was like, I got braids, right? Like I, I run, I win, I have braids. Like, why can't you run and win with braids? But what the younger women were saying to her was like, you've been in this seat, right? Like people know you, like I'm trying to get elected, right? Like I'm new here and that might be difficult for me. And she was really kind of, you know, it's like, I don't see it. Like nobody cares. Um, so I, so I say that to say like those two examples show that there might not be one one way, but instead like that context really matters and the district that you're running in really matters. The relationship that you have with your constituents really matters. Um, and so if there is any takeaway, the takeaway should be, and this is something that I thread throughout the book, is that Black women win when they are most comfortable with themselves because voters see that inauthenticity, right? They see when people don't feel comfortable, they feel like they're hiding something they're trying to like get over. And whatever way that you show up in the world that is comfortable for you, people are attracted to that. So it's like the example of um, a legislator who hired this very expensive firm to help style her because she was trying to run, go from the lower house in the Virginia State House to the, to the Senate. And they put her in pantsuits. They did all these things, toned down her makeup. She liked to wear like bright lipsticks and things. And she lost. And part of what she said was she just felt like uncomfortable. Like she would tuck at the suit or she would, you know, kind of try to hide behind things and she just didn't feel comfortable. And she felt like voters saw through that and thought that she was trying to hide something. And she says, I was, right? I was, they were hiding me. Like I wasn't able to get out there. So she said, I should have run in the dresses that I like to wear. I should have run on my, she wore her hair um, in like a blowout with like big curls. And she's like, I should just game out there with my big curly hair um, because voters would have seen my authenticity, whether they could have talked about my hair, they could have talked about the dress, but they would have seen me. And she felt like wearing those black, like Hillary Clinton pantsuits, what she called it, right? People couldn't engage with her because she really was hiding herself. So I think that's more of the takeaway than thinking about like, are they pragmatic or when to do it or when? It's really like, be you. And that might be the easiest way to get elected because voters are attracted to authenticity. Hello, Dr. Brown. My name is Don Roy Ferdinand. I'm a junior political science major at Howard. I'm from Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, my question 
is sort of trying to bring your research and your work into a global conversation. Mm. Uh, in this class with Dr. Dawuni, we talk a lot about how these issues affect women globally. So I was just wondering if you think that um, certain hairstyles that Black women, American politicians, not to you know sort of centralize the American perspective, right. but I was wondering if you think that certain hairstyles selected by successful Black women uh, in American politics could have impacts on women in other parts of the world and how their hair is politicized because white supremacy and patriarchy operate a little bit different um, in different countries. Sure. Yeah, that, that is an excellent question. And things that I, I honestly thought um, really deeply about. Um, and so I decided against um, in the book, making this a wider, more diasporic conversation because culture mediates so much of what voters find acceptable that to extrapolate or to bring this out into other contexts, I think would be sloppy scholarship or trying to make black women more essential, more essential than what essentialized than what they really are. And in the United States, it has been, um, like it's kind of easy to do this work, if I can make sense. Like it's easier to do this work because of a racial hierarchy where you there's whites at the top and blacks on the bottom. And then there are other groups right in, in between. And in the United States, if you come into the United States, regardless of how long you've been here, your immigration status, um, whether you're from you know the continent, Europe, uh, Latin America, you get homogenized into blackness, right? So you are treated or seen as you know, any, you know, any random black person, regardless of your accent at certain time frame. And here is one of those factors where once you have that kinky, curly, curly texture, you are viewed in a certain way, right? And then maybe people will change their mind once they learn your story. Um, but appearance on the first site, right, is a heuristic that people use. And that's part of um, what we show later on in the book. That doesn't happen in other places in the world, right? There are different kinds of categorizations, even within families about like, you know, um, hair texture and relationship to blackness or in indianity or Indianness, right? That we just don't have in the United States. Actually, yesterday I was having a conversation with a French um, activist and journalist who was sharing with me pictures of um, a book that she did with um, uh, Afro, Afro descended people in their hair in, in France. And some of them were politicians, but those that had natural hair were not from the continent. They were from, um, uh, Caribbean territories, um, like French Guyana. And, uh, and she was sharing that there is so because of the multicultural uh, nisms in France and the different kind of hierarchy that yes, they're not white, they're not French in the same kind of way, but they're not viewed the same way, let's say people from Morocco or Algeria are if you're from French Guyana. Um, and so and there's also like different hair textures in Morocco, right, in Algeria, and those um, who are who are from um, the French Caribbean. And so, yeah, this it just wouldn't translate as well in different places. The other thing I really wanted to do is be clear on the terminology that I use because I first started using up the term like this is an Afrocentric hairstyle, but then being very very clear by uh, my sisters on the continent that they don't see some of the hairstyles that Black women in the United States wear as Afrocentric back to Africa because the hairstyles that they're wearing there don't look like this um, and that they um, might not prioritize having natural hairstyles in some of the same ways or the same kind of connections. So I think it is there, these studies should definitely be done in a regional context that takes into account a specific culture. And so here in the United States context is what I'm specifically talking about, but I really welcome this kind of study um, in other places. But I do think it has to be very specific to a location without trying to say, universally, right? Women with Afro, Afro textured hair experience X, Y, or Z. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Round. My name is Kayla. Um, I'm a junior poli-sci major. So earlier you were saying that you gave this sort of talk and there were white men in the um, audience and that they weren't understanding. So I was just wondering if you think that maybe the education, like educating white people on this topic would help, or if you think just empowering black women to just wear their hair as they want is the better option. Yeah, I mean, I do think that empowering black women to wear the hair that they want is, 
is happening now, right? Regardless of, you know, my study. I think my study is informed by Black women feeling empowered to wear the hair as they want. So I think if I would have written this book 10 years ago or 20 years ago, um, I mean, there wasn't this, this burgeoning naturalistic movement, right? There wasn't, this is like in the last chapter, um, I talked to participants who went to Curl Fest, which is an annual festival that happens in New York City. They also have other ones, um, that are kind of like smaller ones happening. Um, but yeah, there wouldn't have been a Curl Fest, you know, in 1985 in the same kind of ways that there are like this back to naturalistic movements um, in the 2020s. Um, and so I think that stuff is already happening. But the part that I also want to speak to is helping white people understand that Black women are rational political actors, right? So they are responding to white supremacy by deciding how they want to present themselves. So they are making choices about how they style their hair because they know in order to be elected in some places, they have to look a certain way. And that is not necessarily speaking about them and their character. What it is instead of right, speaking to their knowledge of intimate violence of white supremacy and that they have to comport themselves to look like an elected official um, for white audiences. And so that's the part that I wanna to talk to political science about. So that's like the, the educating part to political science that for so often thinks that black women are deviant, that black women don't make sense, that black women are um, not using rational political calculations. And my response is, these are rational, right? These women are responding to white supremacy um, the same way that um, you know my colleague um, and, and your professor, um, Niambi Carter writes in American While Black is that black people have distinct policy preferences that are rooted in their understanding of white supremacy. Black women's um, decisions to how to wear their hair and style themselves is rooted in their understandings of white supremacy. So until we get like the discipline to be really clear on these either or constructs that you're asking us to fit black women or black people into without first recognizing that they're all responding to white supremacy is faulty. So that's really the work that I want to do. So turn this back around on them to say, you know, you know, white political scientists, if you don't address the elephant in the room, everything that you do will be flawed. And so looking at black women and saying, there's no there there, you shouldn't study them. They all think the same, do the same things is really because they're responding to white supremacy in a way that is completely rational, but you guys don't want to talk about white supremacy. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Brown. Uh, thank you again for doing this book talk. It was really um, inspiring to see you speak and everything. Um, my name is Kaya. I'm a junior political science major from the Bronx, New York. I just wanted to ask, as it relates back to um, Judge soon to be Justice Katanji Brown, I've seen a lot of articles recently talking about like the whiteness of her husband and their marriage and circling around um, promoting and black women to marry more white men. Do you, I know that she doesn't fit the light skin, loose hair aesthetic that you discussed in the talk, but do you think that marrying a white man adds to like her social mobility? Um, I, I think that, oh, okay, that's a tough one because I want to be sure that I say the right things. I said something about um, Kamala Harris just factually being married to a white man and the Washington Post ran that like a salacious detail and I got a bunch of hate mail. Um, I had to actually get the, um, had to block my Twitter account and I had to like get my university to stop crazies from coming after me. So I do want to like, really be clear on like how I answer that because I don't want, I don't want the hate mail. Um, but the part, I think that just, the first part of your question that is so disturbing is that her success is tied to, or the, these conversations, right, that are going around on social media, that her success is tied to her white husband, and that there was something wrong with Black men. Um, and these are the conversations that are being, that have always been had around, um, you know, interracial relationships that, so this isn't new, they're just new characters and new actors. But again, the end of that or what this serves is a way to denigrate black people, um, to denigrate black relationships. And I think that should be the spotlight, not necessarily on her individual preference of who she married. Um, but that's not the context we want, because that's, that's not a flashy title, right? Like, so we're not gonna see that in the media. Um, but the other thing to note is Katanji Brown Jackson is in herself a success story, right? Her parents, um, you know, her grandparents were not able to be college educated. Her parents were, they go to North Carolina Central and, and historically black college and university. Um, 
Her parents have deep connections and ties to Black communities, send their daughter with the African name to Harvard, right? She marries a sixth generation Harvard graduate, right? So that is like mind boggling. Because if you could think about, can you go six generations back in your family? Most Black people can't. She definitely can't, right? So, I mean, so I think the conversation is not so much about, did he pull her up, right? I think in some ways, um, her family was already on that trajectory, right? If you think about who her parents were and what they've gone on to do, her mother found um, the premier arts school in South Florida, right? Like her dad is the chief um, litigator for the Miami um, Board of Education, right? So it's not like it says, my mom was a teacher and like, it's like these people are big people who've done what they could, right? And they give their daughter um, and her daughter, should be this, given what her parents were able to provide for her, right? I think looking at her white husband, unfortunately, takes away from that narrative that looks a lot similar to most Black families, right? Um, and it tries to situate her as this exception. And I think the exception is, right, that, yeah, she went to Harvard and she married this Black, this white guy, but the trajectory of who she is and what it looks like might look a lot like some of you in this room or, you know, friends that you know and other people. And so I, I want to, you know, just kind of like walk that back and kind of offer a counter narrative then, um, right, that's kind of what's going around social media. And to be really clear, like it's, it's a tired, lame, been there, done that kind of story that just got recycled for this. Yeah. And I haven't said anything about it because I was like, this is stupid. So I can't think of another way to say that, right? That it's just, <laughs> it's just white people being white. I don't, I don't know what else to say. And then, you know, fake hoteps who are, you know, trying to find something to say about her. Okay, that's me editorializing. I'm sorry. That's it. <laughs> Hello. Okay, last one. Um, my name is uh, Liri Shikunai. I'm a freshman political science major. And I really wanted to tie, it, as the last one, tie it back into just the concept of colorism as a whole, um, as obviously a light skin. I've kind of studied the impact of colorism both in my personal life and through text outside of myself. Um, and one of the biggest things that I've had conversations with both outside and here at Howard University is about how Black American culture is built out of survival mm -hmm. and that's the good and the bad. So that includes the colorism where oh, you're not gonna kill me because I'm lighter than like my sister or my brother. Okay, cool, I'll survive. So with that in mind, even though colorism is not exclusive to the black community, because us black women who are lighter do have more access and more mobility be because of that uh, lightness and favoritism, would you consider it a responsibility of us lighter black women to take action against that favoritism or is that something that needs to be addressed outside of our community or are those two things is it more necessary for those to happen simultaneously yeah so um i think there's a both and there so what i think has been um what has been disappointing is that conversations around colorism tends to focus on the deviantness of like what's wrong with communities of color, right? And so to be sure, right, communities of color worldwide because of colonialism and imperialism have facets of colorism, right? And so it, it gets looked at like, what's wrong with them? Without also recognizing that colorism still operates as a distinct form of racism within the dominant discourse, right? So it has to be this both and. And that's something that, um, because we are interconnected, right? So as much as we would love to say, like if we marginalize folks, people of color work on this on our own, we could figure this out, right? Like we just didn't go to therapy, have a kumbaya session, right? Like we, we could work this out. But the other part that, that has to be worked out too is that dominant societies, the dominant discourse is still reifying colorism preferences in certain instances for lighter skinned people and in certain instances for darker skinned people, right? So it's not a, just a universal, right? Like it's always a preference for dark skin or always a preference for light skin. There are nuances to this. And I think um, looking in places um, in the Caribbean is a very killer example of how colorism sometimes doesn't go the ways that you thought it would have gone for certain practices or people and things. 
Um, so I think it's a, it's a simplistic, a simplistic um, response that it's colorism is an internalization of racism for people of color. No, I don't think that's it. I don't think that we should absolve the dominant group from perpetuating colorism through their racist practice, practice. And I do think that we have to recognize the dynamism within colorism, right? To show that it's not always a preference for lighter skinned people, that there are some preferences for darker skinned people um, and that they take forms very differently based on gender, gender identity, um, and those that are not, you know, um, non-binary or intersex, right? All of these things matter deeply. So, I mean, that's probably like a, a non-answer answer to your question. I don't necessarily think it's your responsibility. I think that it's a recognition. Uh, need. I think we need to be more cognizant of the complexity of this. And I think that what the dominant discourse has done a really good job of doing is saying, hey, it's them over there, right? Like, they, look, they got this colorism thing going on. And so then we start to have these conversations that say, you know, well, light-skinned people, if you if you made room at the table for dark-skinned people, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't have these issues. And that's not it either, right? And that's, you know, a way that we could continue to maintain an imperialistic, a colonial, a racist mindset without addressing, right, the factors that continue to cause this. Thank you. Well, Dr. Brown, thank you so much once again for visiting, visiting uh, virtual Howard University. You see the great students at Howard, you, you were, yes. you're one and you know them, they, they bring it on. So they thank do. you for that wonderful lecture. Um, in my position as a professor for this class, I'm very grateful. And also in my position as director for the Center for Women, Gender and Global Leadership, we are happy to have you once again as a first alum to give us a talk. And we are looking forward to bringing you to Howard University in person. So I'll hand over the closing remarks to Ms. Norwood and thank you once again for visiting and to all our panelists, um, sorry, our audience, thank you for being here with us. Thank so you. Ms. Norwood. Yes, Dr. Brown, this was absolutely amazing. All the information that you have shared with us and everything that you have just given us of yourself, we're just so thankful on behalf of Howard, the Women's Center, and even the audience. And Dr. Dewani, thank you for bringing her in and allowing us to speak with her and get to know her and her perspective. It's been amazing. It's been awesome. So I do thank you so much, and I so look forward to the future work that you're going to work on. Thank you so much for having me. My heart is full and I hope to be in person with you soon. And I have three daughters and I hope that they are bison one day. So I would love to bring them and they can get to see all the excellence that is happening there and in your classroom. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. It's been amazing. Phenomenal. Bye. <laughs>